Hello, and welcome to the latest installment of My Dad Listens to This. I'm Juliet, the daughter. And as always, I'm Kevin, the dad. And happy Father's Day, everybody. And if you're wondering why the thumbnail of this video looks a little bit different than usual, it's because this sweatshirt that you see in the picture was actually designed by my dad. And he designed it after the album cover of the artist we're going to be talking about today. So, Dad, what are we talking about? Well, since it's Father's Day, my daughter kindly let me pick the album that we're going to discuss. Mm -hmm. And so I, of course, picked Unsophisticated Time by Marty Jones. All right, so what do you got? Not a whole heck of a lot. Oh. Um, all I can tell you is that uh, Marty Jones was born and raised in Uniontown, Ohio, mm -hmm. and she was born in 1957. Okay. 22 years later, yeah. she got a degree in studio art from Kent State, oh. and whilst there, performed solo as well as in duos and a trio. Uh, producer Liam Sternberg, who wrote Walk Like an Egyptian, oh. gave Marty her first studio experience having her record demos. She did one for Walk Like an Egyptian, which Marty says the Bengals copied almost note for note. Ooh. That version went to number one for four weeks in 1986. The Bengals one, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Sternberg also suggested that she join Akron band Call Me Gone as they needed a singer. Mm. They recorded an EP of six songs for A&M, but broke up soon after Marty and guitarist George Cabanis got into a physical fight. Uh-oh, who won? M Marty said there may have been a tiny bit of alcohol involved, oh. and apparently he threw the first punch, but Marty, <gasps> Marty finished him off. Ah, oh, good for her. But before that incident, the other band members wanted to redo the record. They got in touch with different producers, one of them being Don Dixon, <laughs> who along with Mitch Easter produced R.E.M.'s early albums. He said he didn't know why they wanted to redo it. It sounded fine. A&M tried talking Marty into going back to the band, but she didn't want to, so they offered her a solo deal. Don Dixon had been keeping in touch with Marty when he found out she was now solo, wanted to work with her. The result was unsophisticated time. Hmm. Don contributed four songs, played almost every instrument, and produced it as well. And sang on some of it, too. Oh, yeah. It was released in 1985 to raves, but it didn't sell a lot. Aww, that's Her sad second sad. album, Match Game, came out in 1986 with Don Dixon once again producing. Which Dad also has. It was okay. Oh. But it had the sound of, like, everyone trying really hard. Oh, to, like, co compensate for the fact that the first album didn't sell as much? Yeah, I think it's like, okay, we're going to get a hit, we're going to get a hit. And I have the album, and I like it, but I don't really love it. See, sometimes if you try too hard, you just stress yourself out, and you don't end up making good art because you just put yourself under so much pressure. That, yeah. That's always sad. Now, her third album on a and Used Guitars, came out in 1988, and to me that was a return to form. Um, it sounded more relaxed. Kind of like, good. kind of like almost going back to the first album, but it had more of a roots rock sound and appeal. And let me tell you, when someone gets credit for playing a bag of bottle caps, <laughs> it don't get more rootsier than that. That sounds interesting. I'd like to hear that actually. Well, that, that was percussion. Like... You know, you shake the. Yeah. Hey, if Buddy Holly's drummer can play on his knee, you can play with a bag of bottle caps. Right now, however, A and M didn't promote it. Oh. So Marty asked to be released. She said their promo man was kind of an ass. Didn't like her stuff. Didn't mm -hmm. just like bother putting any yeah. work whatsoever behind her stuff. That can happen with Broadway musicals too, unfortunately. But that's a whole other story for some other time, if ever. If ever. If ever. Okay. Now, also in 1988, she and Don got married. And 32 hey. years later... They're still divorced. married. Oh, okay. No, they're still married. I'm sorry, well, in rock and roll, a lot of marriages end in divorce. Fifty percent of them do. Well, this but is that's the other... very nice. That's well, very sweet. There, there can be exceptions. Yeah, this congratulations is... to you too. Good, good job. Good job. Yes. <laughs> There's one. Of them. Hey, also during that time, like, like, um, there were feminists who were coming out criticizing that. Well, you know, Don's doing all the work on, you know, on Marty's albums, like playing everything, writing songs. But with each album, it turns into more and more of a partnership. Mm -hmm. And like I said, you know, they got married and it doesn't get more partnery, partnery, partnery than that. <laughs> well, also, they probably realized, you know, once they got married, they would have to change how they handled stuff in the studio so it didn't affect their marriage. I'm sure that's happened with a lot of artists. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. But, you know... She said that, you know, they started off as friends and then things took off from Got there. Got something more, yeah. Eh, like me and me and mom. Yeah. All right. Then Marty got signed to RCA and in 1990 put out one album, Any Kind of Lie, which, again, sounded like everyone's trying too hard. There seems to be this thing of, like, 
like the odd the odd number albums are the ones that are going to be like oh yeah the it's one. it's like the reverse of Star Trek movies. Yes. And the even number albums, it's like they're good, but you can tell it's a little forced. That's interesting. For those who don't know, there's uh, in all the Star Trek movies, what is it? One through how many? Uh, I, I think up to the next gen ones. Okay, so like 10, just to be safe. There's a theory that with all the Star Trek movies, the even ones are the good ones and the odd ones are kind of crap. Like the only exception is like the search for Spock probably. Yeah, that, that one's not bad. Yeah. Okay. So now you know. Okay. Now, R F. Now, after RCA dropped her, she decided to settle down, um, concentrate on her painting, and mm -hmm. she and Don had a daughter, Shane Marie. Aww. In 1996, she put out the terrific live set, Live at Spirit Square, on Sugar Hill Records. Now, the recording was made in 1990 at the Spirit, at the Spirit Square Center for the Arts in Charlotte, North Carolina. Mm. And... It's a nice career summary of those first four albums. I mean, even the stuff on albums two and four, they sound so much better live because it's just uh, like things are kept simple. Maybe it's also because you have the energy of a live audience keeping you going. Like for some people, it puts them at ease to see like the people who come to hear their stuff so they feel like they can party and loosen up a little bit more. Yeah, I guess so. Mm. Also in 1996, Sugar Hill released her album, My Long Haired Life, which... Um, the album cover was a painting that Marty did of you can't you can't see her but it's her in the barber chair and like her locks are on the ground she just like cut her hair something like almost like your style yeah like mine uh, well hold on so sometimes when people make a drastic cut to their hair like that that means they're facing some sort of internal crisis sometimes I don't know either that was like you know kind of like a new beginning type of thing oh, okay. And like I said, you know, she concentrated on their painting. And if you want to see her work, check out MartyJonesDixon.com to see her work. Mm. I've checked out the site, and she does really great work. And um, some of it is, to me, kind of reminds me of Edward Hopper. Have, have her painting sold for a lot? Um, you know, all the ones that I clicked on said that they were sold, so I, I don't know how much they were going for. Mm. But, um, you know, there's a decent representation on that site, so check them out. Okay. Um, since then, Marty's put out albums sporadically, sometimes solo and sometimes with Don. Her last was called You're Not the Boss of Me in 2014, which, you know, with the title, mm -hmm. um, it was songs played in the bossa nova style. Uh -huh. In case you couldn't figure out from the title. And um, I believe that just recently she and Don did an at-home concert, which is on their Facebook page. Since I don't oh, have cool. Facebook, it was kind of like half the screen's blocked, and I'm trying to see, like, what's going on. Do you on. want to log in through my Facebook to watch it? Maybe I will do that at some point. All right, let me know when you want to. Okay, now. You going to tell your story? I am going to tell my story. Yes. <laughs> okay. <gasps> now, as to how I came to find out about Marty Jones and her album, mm -hmm. Way back in 1985, I read a review of Unsophisticated Time in a local paper called The New Paper. And what happened to that? Oh, um, let's see. It was, let me see if I get this right. I think first it was The Real Paper, then The New Paper, then The Providence Phoenix, then it went out of business, oh. and now we've got that Motif magazine. Oh, that's that's okay, kind that's of taken the place. It's sort of similar, where okay. it's like you get this free. Well, the new paper used to be weekly. Motif comes out either now. I think now because of Corona, they're coming out once a month, but if even. Monthly, yeah. But yeah, you get an idea of what's going on locally, mm -hmm. um, most like bands, theater, art, politics, that sort of thing, and you know who's playing at what clubs. Yep. So anyway, the review was written by. Uh, I hope I pronounce his name right, Lou Papineau, P-A-P-I-N-E-A-U. Papineau, Papineau, uh, well, you it hope you pronounced your name right, if you ever hear this. And the thing was, the review was so interesting, it made me want to buy the record. But I couldn't find it around these hair parts. Oh. Like, I think at the time, like, all you, the only places that had records were going to be, like, um, the place... And, Inn and Hope, which is making me look old, <laughs> or the mall stores, which was just going, which were just going to carry popular stuff. What about the record store on the east side? Um, you know, at the time, I wasn't aware of oh. those types of record stores. Okay. Um, I was just still kind of like getting into it. Yeah, okay. yeah, finding out stuff. You had to yourself. Well, it. yeah, but however, however, I did hear about this record store in Boston called uh, Newberry Comics. Oh, wow. Is that like one of the first ones? 
Yeah, it was the one on Newberry Street. Wow. And so I thought, well, they would have to have this. Huh? And the thing was, I don't think I even called them to find out. It was just, okay, I'm going to take a train <laughs> up there. And I found the store, mm -hmm. and I went in there. And for me, it was one of those life-changing experiences. Like a come-to-Jesus moment. <laughs> well, because like I saw all these records by bands I had always heard of, bands I had never heard of. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, since it was Newberry Comics, so like all these comics, this wall of comics, like, oh, my God, I've never even heard of this stuff. And it's like people are like making their own stuff and they're selling it. Like what comics were? I can't okay. remember. It was just like everything, like indie stuff. I mean, just... I got to say, they still hold up pretty well now, even though they have like more nerd yeah. stuff like T-shirts and Funkos. But it's still got, you know, I remember going in there as a kid to the one in um, Attleboro. And it's it's changed enough, but it's still got like its roots in there. You can feel well, it. Well, yeah. I mean, nowadays it's more like, you know, they're pushing vinyl a lot more. The CD section is like really small. And yeah, it's more for like, this is where you go for your pop Funkos and T-shirts and whatever whatever stuff the, the people your age are into these days. Um, the Gen Zers. <laughs> now, best of all, luckily, they actually had Marty's record. So I got it, went home, put it on, and I was just floored by it. It was quirky. It was interesting. It was beautiful. It was like nothing I'd ever heard of. Now, back in those days, what I would do to preserve my vinyl is I would record it to a cassette tape. Mm -hmm. Which we still have some of them. Oh, yeah, I do. I yeah. still have cassettes of stuff that um, that I made of records that still have not seen the light of day on CD. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, this is definitely one of them that I wanted to preserve. Mm -hmm. And um, my thing was, like, it never... Like, CDs had just come out, but not every album was being released in that format, mm -hmm. and this was one of them. It may have made it just to even cassette too, but it was definitely vinyl. Mm -hmm. So it was like, you know, every time I'd see the album, I'd pick up a copy because it was getting really scarce. And I thought, this is never coming out on CD, so I want to have some backup. So I think I picked up like two more copies, which I was looking at the other day. They're still sealed. Oh, wow, really? Yes, they huh. are, because I want to preserve them. <laughs> um but eventually, it did come out on CD in 2000 as part of the Dixon Archival Remnant series. And the only way I got it was I ordered it from some forgotten website that specialized in folk music, of all things. Huh. But they had the CD. I got it. It's also on my iPod, of course. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, apparently these days... It's still tough or impossible to find it on CD. I was doing a search oh. just to see. You can't get it on Amazon. can't get it on eBay. I just did a general search. And apparently, it's, I guess, just out of print again. So when you die, can I sell it on eBay? I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to change my will. <laughs> <clears throat> Don't and see, one. another thing is, like, um, when I was doing my research on Marty, they said that she was one of the artists who lost her masters in the um, Universal Fire back in 2008. There was a fire? Yeah, there was this fire at um, Universal Studios in California, but the park, like where you go like yeah, ride the King Kong ride and all that. Florida? But they had, no, no, oh, this no, was in California. California. Okay, okay. For some reason, they had all the, their masters from these artists in the warehouse on Universal Studios Park lot. Mm -hmm. In 2008, there was this fire, and supposedly all the masters got destroyed. Oh. If you go and do a search on Wikipedia, they have this list that just goes on and on and on oh, about sad. artists who lost their original masters. Jeez. So that could also be... One reason? A reason, yeah. That fire was in 2008. Like I said, the CD came out in 2000. So it's possible those masters are just gone. Well, that sucks. Yeah, it does. Um, and the other thing is, eventually I found the Color Me Gone EP. And again, only on vinyl. And I think I actually have two copies of that. Nice. And again, I put that on a cassette. But since it was an EP, it was like, I don't know. 20 minutes? If even, yeah. yeah. So I got a 45-minute blank cassette. And just recorded it on both sides. So I just constantly, you know, flip it over, flip okay. it over. Yeah, yeah. And that's actually a pretty darn decent album. Um, 
and again, vinyl only. Now, next step is I took a one day t shirt course at RISD, <laughs> and I had done a drawing of Marty from the unsophisticated time cover and made about a dozen t-shirts and the sweatshirt, which I gave you the sweatshirt because yeah. it just... It fits me. It doesn't fit Dad anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, he's taller now. <laughs> yeah, I guess I was still growing. Yeah. Now, I did put one t-shirt aside just in case I ever met her, but, you know, what are the odds of that happening? Cut to... 1986, Match Game album had come out, and Marty and band are playing at the Student Union at Rhode Island College. Yep. So, I, yep, I brought along the t-shirt, and I wore... I, I think I wore one as well. Yeah, I did wear one as well. Um, so after the show, I was trying to figure out where she and the band had gone. I'm like walking all over the student union. Trying to figure and it out. And I had no luck. And like, I just about, I'm just about to leave. And I thought, no, you came this far. You got to do this. Go for it, man. So I'm checking the student union again. I do another search. And I just happen to pass this room. I hear these people talking. I look in and son of a gun, it's, it's Marty and the band. So I knocked. I came in. I met her. I gave her the t-shirt. She signed mine, uh -huh. which I still have. Yep. And she gave me a tour, a tour t-shirt. And she was as nice as could be. Oh, really? What'd she say? Um, I think she was just blown away that. Someone made a t-shirt, and I think it was like, wow, these are better than ours. <laughs> <laughs> Take that, whoever made those shirts. Yeah. And the thing was, like, like the, the Match Game shirt that she gave me, I wore out. I mean, I wore it Ooh. so many times that I just wore it through. Yeah. I mean, I just it just started getting holes and turned into a rag, and like I just TV shirt? couldn't wear it anymore. Um, that's a different story. Okay. But the thing is, start, that's also starting to happen now to my Bengals and Mash Club fan club T-shirt, where you can start seeing through it, and it's just gonna fall apart any oh. day now. Okay, now we jump ahead to July of 1987. Uh -huh. I'm in Canada to meet my pen pal Christine, and guess who's playing at the Harbor Fest in Toronto while I'm up there? Oh, let's think. <laughs> it's Marty. And Don. Yep. Oh, you met Don it too? Was just, it was just the two of them um, doing, a, doing an acoustic show. So this time, um, I did this huge drawing on the bed sheet. Okay. And it was me, Chris, and her BFF, Mary Jo. Uh -huh. Like, we wrote messages on it and whatever, because the both of them, they knew about her, because I think I sent Christine uh, um, a tape. Yeah. Hi, Christine, and, if you're out there. Anyway... We had to drive three hours one way from Sarnia to Toronto. Ah, uh, Toronto's nice. To see, yeah, great city. Mm -hmm. To see the free show. And, it was oh, free? It was free. How come? I don't know. It was, like I said, it was called the Harbor Fest. And it just was like this outdoor fair. There was also a barbecue ribs competition going on. Ooh. And I think I tried this place. It was JJ's Ribs, Best Ribs in Toronto. And they were good. They were really, really good. Good. I wonder if JJ's is still open. Maybe we can I, I hope they are. Yeah. So yeah, like I said, it was just a big open air fair um, at the York Quay Center. And we actually got there a little early to get front row center seats. Nice. And we lost our minds over every song and we were holding up the bed sheet at the end of each song. Now what was on it again? You said um, it was I did the picture. Feature? I did the drawing uh -huh. again from the unsophisticated time mm -hmm. album, except this time I made it a lot bigger because, you know, yeah. bed sheet size. Yeah. So... Um, and I got to do it in color, obviously. Oh, cool. Um, so at one point, Marty looked at us and asked, Are you guys family? Because she was wondering, Who are these people and why are they going nuts? <laughs> they must be relatives. So at the, end of, at, at the end of the show, Marty came out to meet us. Shit! Yep. Nice! So we hold up the bed sheet, and she's looking at And I ask, Marty, do I look familiar to you? And she's looking at me. So we drop the sheet. She sees the T-shirt. That I'm wearing that she'd sign. She goes, oh, my God, you're that guy. And at that point, the police came and hauled me off. Oh, what? No, 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 I'm only kidding. <laughs> oh, my God, I got arrested in Canada. I'm going to sneak across the border. <laughs> so we got to hang out a little bit. And for some reason, Don just stayed in the back. And oh, did you meet Don? Did he no, him? didn't get to meet him. Oh. Uh, which, you know, we kind of wish he'd come out. Well, but, hi, Don. Yeah. And again, she was just as nice as could be. Cool. Now jump ahead to October of 1988. No way! <laughs> this is getting better and better. <laughs> She's playing at the living room in Providence on the Promenade Street location on Columbus Day. Is that still around? No, unfortunately. And they were like, 
the best club to see music. They just, I, I saw so many shows there. I mean, I saw, I, I can't believe like the artists that I saw there, like who were just coming out, like Big Country came played there, who we thought they're going to be so huge. And the place was sold out and they were just awesome. And they turned out to be a two hit wonder, unfortunately, Aww. but it was just such a great show. Also saw Crowded House, same deal. They sold out the place. They actually had, um, they actually had a respectable string of hits. Saw the Bangles there for my first time, and like was just like almost up against the stage. And I remember trying to look up Michael Steele's skirt, because you know I'm a kid. What do I know? Pervert. Yep. Um, but yeah, just saw so many shows there, and they had um, moved a couple of times, but uh, the Promenade. Uh, Promenade Street location was just, oh, it was just great. Just anyway, great, Marty. Great place to see a show. Okay, so she's playing there, living room, Providence, Promenade Street, Columbus Day. Meanwhile, I'm in Virginia with Uncle Joey uh -huh. and Junior, and we were down there visiting Junior's sister, Linda. Junior is Dad's cousin, by the way. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, who unfortunately passed on about a month or so ago. Yes, anyway... Yes. We're down there for the weekend. I remember we went to Bush Gardens down there. We did like touristy stuff. Um, so we had gone down there on a Friday. We get back to Providence, Columbus Day night, and I realize I have enough time to make this show. Holy shit! Which I did. How did you get? Did you get the Ripta or a car or what? Car. Okay. Yep. I I can't remember if I had parked my car at the airport or if it was. Uncle Joey dropped me off at home, and then I jumped in the car and went. That's probably because TF Green is a bit of, like... Well, this was back in 88, and I can't remember oh, what the situation okay. was. But I made it made it just on time to the show. And yes, after the show, I went backstage to say hi. She has her back to me while she's talking to someone. I tap her on the shoulder. She turns around and yells, Oh my God, you're that guy! At which point, the police came and hauled me... <laughs> no, 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 no. no. You know, again, we catch up, and she was just as nice as could be. And now you know the rest of the, the story. History. Now, yep. I'll tell a little story of how we were able to get the shirt. So one day, Dad and I were over at Nana's house, right? And Nana was um, doing a bit of basement cleaning. And she said, Juliet, come downstairs. I don't want, like, she, she whispered to me, like, I don't want your dad to see this. So she said, I found a few pieces of your dad's art, and I found this. And she pulls out the Marty Jones sweater, and she's like, no, I don't think it fits him, but I want you to try it on. So I pull it on, and she's like, go upstairs and show your father. I don't think he's seen this in a long time. And I said, hey, Dad, do you think this fits me? And Dad's, like, doing the crossword puzzle, and he looks up, and he's like, Oh my God, there it is! I've been wondering where it was! So we took it home, and I always wear that sweatshirt. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Okay. Um, thanks, Nana, for holding on to it and not tossing it in the trash. Yeah, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And now, on to the review. All right, let's do this. Okay. First song, Lonely Is As Lonely Does. The song is good, but I think if I really wanted to enjoy it or connect with it more, I'd have to be feeling depressed or lonely, too. Because when you're happy, it's like, I feel bad, but you don't really identify with it. I love how Marty starts off this song almost insulted. Where do lonely people go? You're asking me? You think I know? But it turns out she does. And ask this person what they're going to do about it. My theory is that this person she's talking to drove someone else to loneliness, realized they screwed up, and wants to ask Marty what will happen to the third person. The music of the song is fine. Apparently there's a cello in there somewhere, but I couldn't really hear yeah. it. The voices were the most enjoyable to listen to. The background singers were able to stand out while also blending in the background. Marty's voice is lovely too, and if she had a couple of lessons in her past, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, considering the subject matter, she doesn't seem to be a depressed person, more so she's using music to vent when she needs to. Great song, but you need to be in the mood for it to really hit. And you know, as as many times I've, as I've listened to this album in the past 35 years, I never realized, hey, let's start off with a really sad song. <laughs> and hey, it really works. Uh, this was written by Peter Haas Apple of the DBs, which stands for Decibels. Mm -hmm. and, oh. and they actually named one of their albums that. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of looked at it as like... Um, so this, you know, the singer has been in this situation of not getting over something. I'm thinking more than likely probably a relationship. And that caused them not to, to not move forward with their life. But eventually they did move on. And I think that they're trying to give a friend of theirs that advice that, 
you have to move on. You cannot be trapped in the past. You can't walk. As romantically tragic as that may cause you to appear to others, you yeah. have to move on. And it's like, all we have is today, and we need to get on with it eventually. Because yeah. as as like I said, you know, when you, when you talked about, you know, you're asking me, you think I know. Well, yeah, because she went through the same thing, but she got past it. And I guess this yeah. other person is having a hard time yeah. trying to acknowledge, move on. Trust me, as much as Fitzgerald romanticized the past in Great Gatsby, it sucks. Get Get out of it, get out of it. And look at Gatsby, ended up dead in his pool. Who's Gatsby's uh, favorite superhero? Aquaman? Green Lantern. Who's his least favorite superhero? Who? Deadpool. Oh, jeez. All right, next song. If I could, parentheses, and then outside the parentheses, walk away. Yeah, the parentheses of these first two songs got me. I noticed. I said a lot of parentheses in these titles. I wonder why. So as soon as the music starts, I thought, ooh, this could be like a sexy, sensual dance. Now... Since I've had lessons in ballroom before, I should point out that dance trios aren't done that often, but one would work really well for this song. So the story is simple. Marty is addicted to this guy she's been with forever, but part of her really wants to walk away and be with someone else. Not run away. She's too addicted to this man to break into or run. It doesn't sound like she's an abusive relationship, more so that this guy might be a bit of a bomb or a troublemaker. Still, it's a poisonous love triangle. She doesn't have enough willpower to leave, so she's stuck in an intoxicating limbo. And there's a part of me that wants to call Marty a coward because she can't make up her mind about who she wants to be with. Then I suddenly realize Marty might have a reason for staying with this man. A long reason. As for Don Dixon, his voice pairs well with hers, all while holding his own. But I love this song and I think it should have been the one to open the album. Which brings up a question that I want to ask you. Why is it that, at least some of the time with the albums we've covered on this show, the most kick-ass songs aren't the album openers and they make you wait for them? Why is that? I don't know. Huh. Maybe they think it was going to be. Oh, usually it's like, I know in music, in, in, in music business, it was always, okay, whatever the hit is, that's going to be the first song on the album because that's what the kids want to hear. And if they want to hear these other songs, fine, but at least we got them with the first song. Mm -hmm. um, so Don wrote this one, and I looked at it as like another sad song, but I also kind of looked at it a little differently from you, oh, kind of okay. like a torn between two lovers situation. Mm. Or I thought, well, maybe she's married to the other guy and that's why that's she what can't I leave. Too. And she really doesn't have a good enough reason, reason to like it's like to get a divorce or anything. Yeah, yeah. And um you know there's those lines of face the music of a lie every day until I die, which I thought, oh my mm. God, that's just so devastating. And it's kinda of like it there's no way out. But why isn't there a way out? Yeah. I think there should be. Like you said, it could be like a really long story. It could be like really, really complicated. And yeah, I think um, you bring up an interesting point about, you know, Don, Don singing with her. And I thought, I wonder which guy he is. Probably the new one, if I had to bet. Like if they're married now, maybe she eventually got the courage to leave whoever she was with so she could go and be with Don. Huh. I don't know. But then at the end, she's still singing If I Could Walk Away. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we met, your face was like a magnet. We kissed, I couldn't take the heat. Yeah, and she dreams about him every night. Yeah. Maybe yeah. she's also kind of scared, too, about what will happen if she leaves. Maybe it's more of like a fear thing. You think it could be a security versus the unknown type of thing? Yeah, probably that thing. Because, like, when you get used to being with somebody and then you leave them... It's scary because it's like, you know, that's all you've known in your life for the past few years. And at a certain point, you can't remember what it was like to be alone and starting over again. So you're nervous to go back to that. Okay, which is why in your mom's and my, my marriage, I have to die first. She's so I don't have to go through that. Oh, God. But then she'll get upset if she hears this and go, no, yeah. I have to go first. Well, like, she doesn't want to talk about any of this stuff anyway. I know. All yeah, right. That's going to be awkward for the will and stuff. Okay. All right, moving on. Next song, Show and Tell. Sad song number three in a row. Well, sort of. I thought this one was a bit more fun. But as I really? read my notes, this doesn't feel like a game of show and tell so much as a game of truth or dare, and Marty's daring you to tell the truth. Tell me you love me and show me you want me. And then she says, if you cheat, you lose. But with a song like this, that's definitely a double meaning where if you cheat on her, oh, bet your ass you lose. And once again, we have another great short duet from Don Dixon. And I'm sorry, but every time I think of his name, I think of that clip from The Simpsons. Dasher, Dancer, Prancer. Dixon, Dixon. Comet, Cupid, and Don Dixon. Sit down, Homer. 
Oh. <laughs> anyway, so then when you think this song is going to fade away, the string quartet comes in. And at first they play this sexy music where it sounds like things may be approaching a literal climax, but then things take a sharp left turn and we're left with this ominous scary ending instead. Sounds like he cheated and lost the game. But I'm more surprised people don't use this as a sexy bedroom song. But if you do, you might want to stop it before the end though or things are going to get awkward real quick and you're going to be like, what the hell's this? Okay, this song was written by Richard Barone of the Bongos, who were hot in the 80s for about a minute. The Bongos? The Bongos. Like Bingo Bango Bongo Irving? Oh, I never thought of it that way, but I actually have their, um, um, I've got two of their records. One of them is, uh, Drums Along the Hudson, mm -hmm. which I guess is a play of Drums Along the Mohawk, which I'm currently reading, great book. Um, and then their hit on college radio was a song called Numbers Would Wings, which was catchy as anything. Hmm. Anyway, to me, I kind of looked at this as like, Marty comes across as so desperate for this man to love her. She tells him he can make the rules. Just show me that you love me. Just tell me that you love me. Please. Now that you say that, this kind of gives me like a Grace Jones love is the drug vibe. Catch that buzz love is the drug that I'm thinking of where it's like you'll do anything for the hit. And it kind of blurs the lines between love and sex. I guess. Yeah. But and to me, like and to cap it off, there's this desperate string quartet that comes in at the end yes. and it just oh, everything went wrong and it just magnifies marty's situation and as you said it does not end well you're wondering nope. what the what, hell happened exactly yeah and i think I, I i think that quartet just captures everything just so perfectly yeah so kudos to the musicians for playing it like that yeah yeah great great song so we've had Three kind of bummer songs in a row to me, but the thing is, they are just so yeah. I like two and three a lot. Well done. I love the arrangements and the singing and 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 Marty and slash or Don. They just have great taste in picking songs written by others, and like and I said, and Don's musicians. written yeah, and you know Don wrote some of these songs too, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, for me, it's like. You know, trifecta so far. Nice. Let's see if we can go for our, a, a quadfecta? Quadfecta? Uh, quadruped? Uh, all right. Something? Which brings <laughs> Something. us to... Rhythm of Shallow Breathing. I'm sorry. I read that <laughs> title and I thought of that dude breathing and another one rides the bus. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Now, here's what I find interesting off the bat. You have the recorder, which has been around forever in various forms, from wooden to plastic. Right. And then you have that juxtaposed with the computer notes from, uh, let me check my notes here, a Zorch tube defabulator. Sounds like a made-up nonsense from the early Trek TV shows, like the name Groppler Zorn from uh, Encounter Farpoint in the Pilot. I gotta show you this clip later where this woman was reviewing it and she cannot get over the fact that the guy's name is Groppler Zorn. All right. Anyway. So then, after those two instruments come in, the um, the recorder and the Zorch tube defabulator, whatever the hell that is, there's this tech-sounding xylophone and a drum just playing basically whatever the hell it wants. Screw-keeping time. Like, it's keeping time, but it's just haphazard. Then a bass and a guitar come in, and then the instruments calm, down the, he calm the hell down for a little bit. Then we have more techno stuff and synths. Some of it sounds like your cat messing around with a computer keyboard while GarageBand is up and running. <laughs> it's like clicking away, especially the weird computer drums. I can't even pay attention to lyrics on this one because the chaos of the instruments just overwhelms me. It was probably my least favorite album on, on the sounds. On this, uh, it was least probably favorite my least song. favorite song on the album so far as I was writing this. And I wrote, I'm surprised I thought this considering I thought I'd only make that comment for when the Elvis Costello track came up. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to get to that. Don't worry. Oh, I'm sure we will. Oh, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, hey, it's our first non-bummer song. Yes. Our, mm -hmm. Written by Marty and Don in 1G Weimer, which I did a lot of research and couldn't really nail down who the guy was. Sorry. It's okay. um, yeah, to me, this isn't the greatest song on the album, and it's also the longest at 5 minutes and 35 seconds. That makes sense. 35 years later, I have no idea what this song is about, but I got to say, in all the time I've listened to this album, I have never ever skipped over this song hmm. so there's something about it that just keeps me listening mm -hmm. and the funny thing is like like with all these songs and with like every song that we review i always try and do lyric research just to 
you know, make sure, okay, this that's al- what they're saying. This album's hard, though. There's only, like, three tracks on here where you can find the lyrics. The rest of it, you actually really have to pay attention. Yeah, so listen whilst, hard. So whilst doing lyric research, I did come across some information about how shallow, bre- about shallow breathing in a medical context. Um, shallow breathing it can be a result of various anxiety disorders, asthma, hyperventilation. I thought of hyperventilating. Pneumonia, yeah. pulmonary edema, shock, anxiety, stress, and panic attacks. Yeah. Now, but the big thing about this song is, and you brought it up, what the hell is a Zorch tube defibrillator? Yeah. Chip Garrett gets credit for playing one, but what is it? What the hell is Besides it? Besides pretentious. Nobody knows. MIT <laughs> defines Zorch as propelling something very quickly. Okay. They also define it as influence. I didn't have enough Zorch to get that B raised up to an A in my class, man. Ew. Yeah. That's the least you sentence I've ever heard come out of your mouth. Thank you. Anyway... Um, I do have a thor- theory about what it is. I have a feeling that could, it could be an instrument that Chip Garrett himself built. This goes back oh, to okay. your favorite guy in the world whose album we almost reviewed. We're not doing it, though, but the Blurbophone, yeah. Yeah, Spike Jones. Like, he had musicians who would invent their own instruments just to get particular sounds. Uh-huh. And maybe that's what happened in this case. I have absolutely no idea. Okay. All right. Next song. Follow you all over the world. I always like it when the song opens with the sounds of the studio. It's like an exclusive peek behind the curtain. Oh, poor Marty. She wanted a simple fling and ended up getting trapped. These two people had it all figured out. Guy says, I'm not a buy you flowers kind of person. Let's just have one night. But then he changes everything by saying, come to Rome with me. And Marty's a goner. And from the tone of the song, even though it's a different songwriter, it sounds kind of like the prequel to If I Could Walk Away. And that also offers up another reason as to why Marty can't leave. She doesn't have enough money to start over somewhere. And the lyric I love the most is, Don't care if I'm your weekend pal. I don't care if I'm your sometimes gal. Wouldn't hesitate to follow you all over the world. She's saying she doesn't care how often she gets to be with him as long as they can have these special moments together where she feels like she's the only one who matters in this moment. That's it. And that hit like a ton of bricks. It sounds like the guy duetting with her feels that way too, but maybe he's too scared to go any further because he doesn't know what would happen. I think I'm going to call his version of this song Commitment Light. It's a serious (laughs) song and a poignant one, but there was a light moment where we had those strings that sounded right out of Dean Martin's That's Amore, only there ain't no amore here. Wow, that's interesting. I kind of looked at it as like, like the ultimate in romantic devotion because wherever this guy's going, she's going. Yeah, but she says at one point she can't afford to go with him somewhere, and it's like oh, we're gonna get to we're gonna get to that yeah, in a moment. Yeah, he doesn't want her around permanently. Just whenever he goes on these trips. But like you said, it's commitment light. He just he just is afraid to take that big step. But anyway, mm-hmm. this is the song I think Marty will always be known for. Really? Even though her mom told her he could have had it would walk like an Egyptian. That could have been your really? song. That's what she said in an interview. Might have been tongue-in-cheek, but, you know, knowing mothers. Tough love, Mom. Okay, now, this was written by one Bland Simpson, who, son of a gun, huh? is a, is or was a professor of English and creative writing at UNC Chapel Hill. Oh. And um, Don, also went to, Don Dixon also went to UNC, so they might have just happened to have met up. I think they might be close to the same age so i'd be okay. kind of surprised if he actually have him for you know a, a class mm-hmm. but I, I figure you know that unc connection they must know each other somehow yeah. now get this you, you can maybe explain this to me okay bland simpson also won a tony <gasps> now get this i had to look this okay, up it said okay. what, what do you it got? is called special tony award for live presentation for Full Moon in oh. 1999. It's F O O L. I have okay. no idea what that means. Like, what's a special award? Is it so, kind of like those so, lifetime achievement Grammys that don't mean no, anything? It's something totally different. There is a lifetime Tony Award, which they give out to playwrights and actors or people who have made special contributions to theater. Terrence McNally got one at the last Tony Awards before COVID 19, shortly before he died. This Tony Award is given to people who do special concerts and special, like, um, like limited engagements on Broadway but that are so big that they deserve some recognition of some sort like when when Bruce Springsteen did his Broadway show he got one of those Tony Awards for when he did his Broadway concert series okay I think the Rascals could have been easily nominated for one yeah maybe there's a certain number of performance requirements that you have to do but 
with Springsteen's show, I think the reason that he was the one who got nominated is because you've seen Springsteen in concert before. He always tells the story of each song. Yeah. So I think that adapted to the theater world a lot better than the Rascals concert. Mm -hmm. So it's just in recognition of when you bring a great piece of art to Broadway for a limited time. And they always give it to like outsiders who are coming into the theater community for a first time. Sort of as like a really nice welcoming gift. Okay. Yeah. Make well, sense now? Okay. Okay. Anyway, to me, this song is a true gem, and it starts. It's it hilariously starts off with, like you said, that studio dialogue. Now, have you listened to what they're saying? I couldn't make it out. Oh yeah, Don's talking about. He thinks how heaven's probably a lot like New York. It's got good restaurants, and you don't need a car. <laughs> I like that version. And then we get to the hopelessly romantic part, also known as the rest of the song. Mm -hmm. I mean, like I said before, to me, it's the ultimate in romantic devotion. Marty, well, you know, see the song's title. Yeah. Follows the guy all over the world. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's funny that, you know, but Tibet's too far away, so let's meet up neath the sea, the trees of Lebanon. So she's got the cash to hop on the plane and, you know, yeah. you know, travel over to... Um, Maybe she's just being wise about how she spends her money. Well, you know, it's like, you know, they're in Rome, mm -hmm. they're in Lebanon, they're here, there, they're everywhere. Mm -hmm. And like you said, it's like maybe this guy's just trying to stay one step ahead or it's like, I love you, but I just can't commit. Because to and, me, it sounded like, um, you know, I think we talked about this in the Rick Derringer episode. It kind of reminds me of, like, the rock and roll girlfriends where it's like they'll meet somebody on tour, then they'll have a nice time, then the guy goes off to do other things. But this just seems like one of those more committed girls that tag along for the ride. Yeah, it could be. everywhere. But anyway, I love this song. Absolutely love it. All right. Okay, now, side two. First song, Neverland. This sounds like a pop song that could be released today in terms of instruments and background vocals. Oh, yeah. The catchiest part of this song is where is where the never-nevers, easily. Although, I did think it was a man at first singing in a tenor range, but it's not a man. So my apologies to Nancy Jeffries, but you do have a lovely alto voice. The one thing with this song, though, is Marty telling us, you'll never understand the significance of the term Neverland or what it means. And I'm like, lady, we've all seen the Disney movie, if not read the original book by J.M. Barry, which I have not read, so I'm not exactly sitting on a high horse here. Now, I couldn't make out the words in this one, but listen, listen, Marty, if a guy left you and all he said was Neverland, we kind of all know what that means. He probably has a case of Peter Pan syndrome and doesn't want to grow up. And yes, Peter Pan syndrome is a real thing, and from what I've read, it sounds pretty scary. Anyway, not my favorite, but I could rock out to those Never Nevers over and over. Okay, this is another Peter Hoss Apple song, and I was able to find the lyrics online. Mm -hmm. And even though I kind of knew most of them from here in the... Uh, here on the album. Um, yeah, I like the way that the guitar chimes in at the beginning, then followed by a, what I think is a drum machine. Like, it could just be the way that Don Mike's, uh, Mike the drum kit, but to me, it just always kind of sounds like a drum machine. It could be a drum maybe machine. Maybe it is. Maybe there's real drums. Uh, maybe both. I don't know. Mm. And then the rest of the band blasts in. I mean, it just explodes. Yeah. yeah. And... Um, and it just never stops. It just rocks its ass off. Mm -hmm. And that kind of looked as like, you know, bummer lyrics, though. It's like, you know, where did our love go? Neverland. But I never got it in the sense of, like, Peter Pan to me. It was just like, yeah, this is just never going to happen kind of thing. Oh, like, we're never going to land. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's like she made it the one word. So, she, like, you know, the first thing I thought of was Peter Pan. If she had made it two words, maybe I could, like, I would have... Come to that conclusion. Well, it was funny. As, as I was doing the um, lyric research, I typed in Neverland, then Peter, and all this Peter Pan stuff came up. Then I typed in Haas Apple, and it all kind of disappeared. <laughs> then the lyrics came up. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just never, it never hit me as like being like Peter Pan syndrome. I mean, maybe it is. Mm -hmm. Could I be. don't know. Um, just an aside, um, when I saw uh, Nick Lowe back in 1986 at Lupo's Heartbreak Hotel. Is that when you met him? When it was, oh. yeah, that was when I met him. Um, when it was current, when it was at its Westminster Street location. The opening band was a local Northeast regional band called The Incredible Casuals. And they actually did Neverland. And I'm standing there like, I know this song. And they did, they did, it, they were just a trio. They did a great job with the song. Nice. All right, next song, Hiding the Boy. Has someone else done a cover of this song? 
If they have, I've never heard it. Okay, because I feel like I've heard the opening lyrics coming out of a male singer's mouth. Once again, I couldn't make out the lyrics to this one, but it feels like Marty is hiding someone from a group of people who only want to prod and stare. The vocals are fine, but I'm going to bring it up since I haven't uh, brought this point up for any of the previous songs he's played on so far. Yeah, go ahead. Mitch Easter sounds great on the electric guitar. Doesn't overdo it, doesn't show off, but he's able to adapt to the tone of every song he plays on, and that's what makes his playing stand out. Yep. That's all I got. Oh, okay. Um, to me, every time I hear this song, I think, okay, it's time to get a little funky. Just a tad. I yeah, mean, the way that the bass comes song, in. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. And um, I love the lines about kiss each word, put it to bed now, mm -hmm. which I have no idea what that means, but I just kind of like that image. Um, and yeah, great guitar solos from, from Mitch Easter. I mean, the one in the middle and then the one at the end, kind of mm -hmm. like tying it all together. Yeah, it's just really great guitar work. Mm -hmm. And as for that phrase, fishing from a window, you can yeah. actually do that at some hotels. Oh, cool. And when I was doing research to find out what those hotels were, I found a picture of the Beatles from 1964 <gasps> fishing from their window at the Edgewater Inn in Seattle. Nice. And the thing is, like, someone actually wrote a book commemorating the 50th anniversary of that incident. Obviously, it's a small press local book yeah. somewhere out in Seattle. Hmm. But they were talking about, you know, that's when the Beatles came to Seattle, which, of course, you know, was a big freaking deal back in 64. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, there are places that you can do that. Cool. Um, I'm Probably not sure what it means in the context of this song because yeah. after all these years, I still don't know what it's about, but, my God, it's catchy. Fishing out the window is probably going to make a comeback during COVID right now. If you want to stay in your house and go fishing, just fish out your window. As long as there's like a lake, you yeah, know, right behind your house, yeah. Or your window, that would be helpful. Yeah. All right. Next song. Talk to me. From those opening notes, you can tell Marty's not fucking around in this one. <laughs> she wants to talk, but the part that sets you on edge is when she shows him, "I'm not gonna stab you." It's either show and tell or talk to me. Yeah. So it's like. Well, why else would he be worried about you stabbing him, Marty? Then again, maybe sitting down and talking about your feelings is very uncomfortable for him. Not easy for everyone, but there's such a feeling of doom around this song, especially with the resonant drums. Then you have the feeling Marty has some tea to spill about the music industry because she says she sees this man on the front page of every magazine and you want to know, Oh, who is it? Spill, come on! And we never know, but then we hear the guy basically say, You're still a kid, which... That's got to sting as a grown-ass woman. And then when they finally go head-to-head -head and you realize they're getting ready to talk or scream or shout, the song ends. Mm -hmm. So I guess whatever comes next is not meant to be heard by prying ears. Uh -huh. Now, I heard Don Dixon say once that when he wrote this song, it had a zombies feel to it. Okay, I haven't heard the zombies yet, so we'll see. Um, you'd probably know this song. Um, the big song is um, Time of the Season. I've also, the um, there's Tell or No, mm -hmm. and you must... You're very familiar with the Santana version of She's Not There. Oh, the zombies! Oh, and I, I'm familiar with the original one, too. Yes. Yeah, okay, okay. so that's that's their song. Mm -hmm. Okay, now Don's original version on, and this is the name of the, the title of the album, Most of the Girls Like to Dance, But Only Some of the Boys Like to, doesn't remind me of the zombies at all, but Son of a Gun, Don practically grafted their arrangement of Time of the Season onto Marty's version, and it works so well. Did they get I mean, bas basically, this song is Time of the Season with different words. Did they get in trouble for it? I've never heard that. I guess not, I'm assuming. Mm. Maybe it's because it's like she, it's like they wouldn't be able to generate enough controversy around that, considering, like, how many people know who Marty is? And, like, well, you know, now thanks to our worldwide audience, you know, I've probably created some trouble. Thirteen more, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, but the thing is, like, it really, really works. I think the arrangement captures the lyrics and sets the mood so well. And it's another bummer lyrically. I mean, to me, it's just Marty's just trying to find out what the hell happened to us. Mm -hmm. And at the end, it's like she's pleading, like she's almost losing her mind, and it's like he still won't tell. Oh, God, and, yeah. But the thing is, like, that line about I ain't gonna scalp you always cracks me up, though. It reminds me of the scene I saw in that reality show that I watched, Love is Blind, where 
on the day this, this couple was getting married, Giannina and Damien, they went up to the altar. She said, I do. He said, I don't. So she runs out of the building. The camera follows her like Jerry Springer. And then she comes back in to face him. And she's like, you couldn't have told me. And then she picks up a chair, plants it down in front of him and goes, let's talk. Because apparently that's the one thing we can't do. Oh. So that's kind of the vibe this gave me. <laughs> because she looked ready to kill that guy too after he did that in front of their family and friends. And then proceeded to say what was wrong with her in front of the wedding party too. And were her family and friends going, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, she is like that. No, but like her mother was mad. Oh, that poor woman. Uh, All right. Now we get a one minute instrumental that leads into your boy. Wait, wait, can we talk about the hidden track a little bit? The The instrumental? instrumental? Yeah, Yeah. sure, go ahead. It's just an instrumental of a nice piano and that's kind of it. Well, yeah. Yeah, but then it's got that thing of like, it's got like the the chimes, like almost like a, like a bell tower clock chime. Yeah. Yes. Oh, well, that's, that's in the, um, that's in the element within her. I was talking about this little, the little instrumental before that. Well, yeah, that little instrumental. Yeah. Wait a minute. Am I thinking of something different? Wait a minute. You might be. Because wait in minute, between those two songs, there's a hidden track. <laughs> but if you listen closely, though, there are. That's at the end, though, of the, of the element within her. There's like a short little instrumental at the end of Talk to Me before it goes into the element within her. Really? I have listened to this album for the past 35 years, folks. <laughs> I'm just putting stuff where it doesn't belong. I found where something I think you it did. should go. Oh, my God. Well, we'll revisit this. All right. The hey, I've her. got, you know, yeah. I've got CRS. All right. What? Can't remember shit. Oh, okay. All right. So, yeah, my boy, the element within <laughs> her. All right. So, the way I interpret this is this is like Elvis Costello trying to write George Harrison something. Really? Yes, but it doesn't work. Clearly the song is about someone who loves a woman because she's beautiful, but he wants to talk about a reason that isn't shallow or skin deep, so he's searching for something else to talk about. So he decides to settle on the element within her. Woo. The only funny part is... <gasps> also known as something. Yeah. That's why I thought that. All right. The only funny part of this song is when he asks, are you cold? And she goes, no, but you are. La, 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 like a taunting. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think my favorite part of the song is towards the end when they go, it's the element within her over and over with the la, la, la backup singers and the strings because they create some nice harmonies. And then we have the church bells tolling out the time, which I knew how to play on the piano once. I probably still could if I had like, mm-hmm. the sheet music with the notes on it. And then the sound of splashing water. Uh, Okay, it's not the worst song by Costello I've ever heard, but for but this is the same thing with all his songs. For every good part, there's always a bad part that makes the song suck just a little <laughs> bit, so it's never completely good. It's like the good place. We take something good and make it a little bit worse. <laughs> <sighs> well, if you get a chance, mm-hmm. go um, go online, mm-hmm. do a search for. Um, or I guess just go on rollingstone.com, do a search for the Punch the Clock review, mm-hmm. which this song was originally on, that Elvis album of the same name. Mm-hmm. You will laugh your head off reading the review. You'll be sitting here going, yeah, yeah, I could have written this review. Yeah, that's exactly what I mean about this guy. Yeah. Because it starts <laughs> off the first sentences, well, no one's going to call this album Masterpiece. And it just kind of goes from there. But anyway, yeah, this was written by one E. Costello. So, of course, I have no idea what it's about. Because yeah. I got the lyrics and it looks like there seems to be like three different non-specific things going on. Mm-hmm. But there's nothing concrete about it beyond clever wordplay. Like you said, you know, you know, she, he, she says, are you cold? But no, you are la, 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 la. And supposedly those la, la, la's mm-hmm. were supposed to harken back to like the Mersey Beat, catchy British invasion stuff. You look pained. What do you want to say? Okay, so I just realized what Elvis Costello reminded me of. So my friend Aaron and I, who went to work with me, we'd been talking about existentialism and existentialist philosophers. And when I just realized there's a lot, there's something that Aaron once said to me that I think can be replied to Elvis. It's that... What philosophers say in paragraphs can really only be said in one sentence. This is true. It's like... And usually that sentence is, this is bullshit. Yeah. Elvis Costello's writing is like the Gilded Age in America. Looks pretty on the surface, but deep down, whole crock of shit. Whoa! (sighs) Did you come up with that yourself? Yes, I did. Oh, very nice. (sighs) And we have it preserved for posterity, folks. Yeah, no, let's move on before I get mad. No, I still got more to say. Okay. Hmm. Okay, Marty and co-lead vocalist Annie Richmond Boston from the Swimming Pool Cues. She's very good. She is. She is. I think they have a, um, 
um, they're a nice blend, mm -hmm. and they make it work. It's a ca it's catchy, and sometimes that's all I need from a song. Because like yeah. I said, I have no idea what it's about. But you got those la la la's. You've got the great co lead vocals, and it just all works. Mm -hmm. And yes, the bell part comes at the end. But I wonder what they're tolling. Is it the is it the old ask not for whom the bell tolls? It, it tolls, tolls for thee. thee. And I'm gonna walk into the ocean and drown myself. Colin Ophelia, only the ocean instead of the river. Uh, I don't know. I like. I think it's the time. Well, you figure our river's really that deep enough to drown. Depends on the size of the river, I suppose. I don't know, man. I don't live in Denmark. I don't know how deep the rivers are over there. Yeah, it's true. I mean, if you're talking the Mississippi, yeah, mm. not a problem. All right, next. What is real? And my first note was, oh, dude, I don't want to get philosophical <laughs> right now. Because, like, I was listening to this album, and it was hot, and I was getting drowsy. and like, I don't want to think about philosophy. You could have turned on the air conditioner behind you. Oh, the air conditioner was on, but I was still getting tired because I hadn't slept all that night. But I actually like the message of the song. As you get older, you start to see what's important in life. But then Marty says she's sure of what she knows. But something tells me as you get older, you're never really sure because no one in this life has all the answers. So she's off to spend some quality time with her friends. Oh, we have a trombone solo. And it reminds me of this meme I saw of music, and I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit. So it was like, goth music. The world is broken, but there's not beauty in the dark parts. Punk music. The world is broken, and I'm mad as hell, so I'm going to fight to fix it. And the last, last remark was about ska, but I'm going to paraphrase it for this song. The world may be broken, but I've got a fucking trombone! <laughs> That's pretty good. Yep. I, I, I'd agree with that. Okay. <laughs> this song was written by Gerald Duncan of the Accelerators, who were produced by Don Dixon. Mm -hmm. Who else um, did he do? Anyone else well known? Or? Who? Don Dixon? Yeah, for producing. Oh, man. If you went on to... Wikipedia, I think they have a list, Completely and it's a okay. long list. He's done, like, so many bands. And the thing was, like, he paid his dues at the, at the beginning. He was in this band um, in North Carolina called Arrogance for 13 years. Wow. And he just, supposedly, that was, like, his his um, education, like, learning how to play, produce, write songs, all that. That, mm -hmm. was, that was his music school mm -hmm. right there, was doing it, you know, getting out there and just doing it. Sometimes it's the best way to learn. Yeah. So yeah, he produced Marty, The Smithereens, uh, Marshall Crenshaw, oh, wow. um, I didn't know that. R.E.M. What? Uh, yeah, first. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah, he he co-produced. I I want to say their first two albums at least with uh, Mitch Easter. Okay. Um, Not Murmur or anything. Yeah, it was their first album. Oh, I didn't know that was their first one. And I think he also did their second album, Reckoning. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like I said, it's like this huge list. You go on there, I mean, he's just done like so much. Mm -hmm. All right, anyway. Um, and, you know, I, I got a, just a little aside here before I get into my what is real. Uh, finish it up. Um, yeah, I, you know, I give him credit. I mean, you know, he's done his own thing from the beginning. Marty's done her own thing. And they're just doing really well. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, they still live in live in Ohio, which you know they call a the center of the universe. Oh, it's not wow. too it's not too far from New York. Them and and it's like fell. and it's like they don't get caught up in like the like the music business end of it with like the hey you're great yeah. you're great kid. That's you're why Dave Chappelle someday. lives in Ohio because he wants to be as far away from Hollywood as possible. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. but you know they do their own thing. They keep it going and. You know, great for them. You know, I, I, it's going to sound hokey, but I am really, really happy for them. Good job. Good job. Yep. So anyway, um, yeah, I look at it as like, you know, you know, she talks about how she's in the middle of her life. I'm thinking. How oh, old are you? I think I want to say she wasn't even 30 at the time. Like, oh, no, you no. still got a ways to go. Yeah. But I um, hope you got a ways to go. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, but it's like, you know, she's reflecting on things past, telling us what she's learned. And I, I suppose anyone can do that. Um, not supposedly, you know, being in the middle of your life, but just like looking back and realizing, yeah, I probably could have done that stuff different, but you can't change the past, so try to make the future better for yourself and live for today, sha-la-la-la-la. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because she's saying, you know, it's different than it was before, didn't know, but now I'm sure. And I don't think it's that, like, she has the answers to everything, but it's like, okay, if this situation comes up again, I'll know how to handle it. I know what to do, and I know not what to do. Mm -hmm. And I thought, once again, the music gets trifle funky at the end. Mm. Just a tad. Not a whole heck of a lot, but it's it's there. Maybe she likes funk music. You don't know. Heck yeah, I Everyone's mean, we're not talking friends. like, you know, James Brown or P-Funk. Oh, but it's, no. It's, it's in there. Yeah. All right, final song. 
We'll All Be Gone. Yay. Good song for a closer, though. It's in terms of a title, like, We'll All Be Gone. A song about how since we're all going to die anyway, don't hear your fears into the world. We're going to be okay. The voices sound lovely as they sing such a downer message, but it's perfect to listen to when the album is about to end. It's like um, the Brian Stokes Mitchell album that I got recently. He sings about, you know, I, I think that's an example of a perfect closer because he says, I haven't sung half the songs I want to sing. Ah, well, until next time. I'm like, that's very clever. And this one's clever too. And because it's clever because when they're done singing, they're gone and they're not going to come back. They'll come back in another album, but they're not going to come back on this one. Yeah. Yes. Uh, this is written by Don. And, you know, Marty starts, like, she's listing things at the beginning, and then she says, they're not worth the paper I'm writing on. We'll all be gone. Good times. <laughs> Open with a bummer, close with one. Yay, um, the bummer circle. But the thing is, though, it's catchy. And that line, we'll all be gone, seems to take up most of the song. Mm -hmm. They sing it a lot. Mm -hmm. And the way that they sing it, it almost has, like, this campfire sing-along vibe to it. Let's gather around the campfire. And then as you're singing this, campfire you want to jump into the fire because it's just, like, depressing <laughs> It's just like depressing you so much after friends? facing your mortality this way. It's like, what else is there to live for? One of my friends has jumped in fire before. Mm. But it wasn't, it was like, um, it was this festival in, in the Azores on San Miguel. It was like a party where like people could leap over the fire and try to clear it. And she did. Oh, good. Okay. Hi, it wasn't... Bree. No, Bree's fine. Bree's fine. Okay. Because I'm thinking like, you know. You know, you put your left foot in, you, you put, put your, your left, left foot, foot out. In, you put your you do the, oh my God, I'm on fire. Ah, well, that's what it's all about. Yeah. I actually did a post about the hokey pokey a while ago. I was like, imagine if the fan of the opera got caught doing the hokey pokey. <laughs> no one saw him. Yeah, oh, I, was, I was half asleep. Anyway. I guess you were. But yeah, it's kind of a downer, mm -hmm. the way to end the album. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, they went on to Match Game, which I have a Match Game story for you. That's Bowie related. Because... On uh, Match Game, she did the cover of Soul Love, and oh. I was reading an interview with Don Dixon. I, I just found it yesterday, and he was talking about how uh, he and Marty saw uh, Bowie on the Glass Spider Tour. <gasps> oh, you can find the full thing on YouTube for free. And they so actually fun. got backstage and met him he said oh yeah you did the cover of soul love on on your album how's your album doing hope it's selling I'm like oh what a oh, nice that's guy nice of him. yeah that's sweet he's oh. always a nice guy to people he meets backstage that's what i've heard from people okay now the sum up you go ahead okay overall this album is okay most of the songs on the album are decent but only if you stand out from the rest due to the subject matter when marty tries to have instrumentalists stand out in a few tracks that can lead to a more chaotic song than i personally want to listen to still she has a great voice she knows how to interpret a song and i hope more people give her the recognition she deserves because even though she didn't write most of the songs she knows how to tell their story and that is a gift in and of itself oh i like that yep because yep. some people don't know how to do it. There are some singers where it's like, you know, they sound nice, but they can't really tell the story, which is why, in my opinion, especially when it comes to musical theater, it's better to start, it's better to be an actor who sings than a singer who acts. Because when an actor sees a song, they see the lyrics on the page, and to them that's like a script, so they know how to infuse it with emotion and make it stand out. So if Marty, you know... If she took an acting class, I wouldn't be surprised. Or maybe she just has this innate gift that some singers just don't have. It you could know? be. Yeah. I mean, for me, I've loved this album for 35 years now. And, you know, on one level, the singing, the playing, the production, um, and the song selection, they're superb. Yes. They're I mean, it's good. just cannot be beat. On another level, it expanded my musical horizons from um, full screen to cinemascope. <laughs> And on another level, it was just those ad adventures. Yes, I'm doing the quote fingers here that I had. You know, the three times I got to meet her. And, um, you know, it's definitely one of my top five and one of my top five albums ever. I just mm -hmm. absolutely love this album. Cool. Always have. Always will. All right. All right. Well, this was fun. Um, all right, so thank you as always for listening to another episode of My Dad Listens to This. And happy Father's Day to anyone out in our audience who is a father or has a father or, yeah. Happy Father's Day, Don Dixon, if you happen to be listening to this happy podcast. Happy Father's Day, Don. All right, so if you want to listen to more episodes, then uh, if you follow me, then uh, please hit the subscribe button. Tap the bell if you want to be notified right away. If you like this video, give it a like. And if you don't like this video, well, too bad. We're going to be making more, so... 
That's that. We have our 13 listeners, right? Yeah, they're Excellent. dedicated, damn it. Thank All you. Right. Thank you, guys. Um, if you have any specific thoughts that you want to let us know about, please uh, leave them in the comments. Now, if you want to get the uh, episode from us but not necessarily on YouTube, here's what you can do. If you follow me on Facebook, I post the episodes to Facebook. If you follow me on Twitter, I post the episodes to Twitter. If you follow me on Instagram, the channel link is in my bio, and I post what episode we're going to be doing. So how do they find you on these different places? Okay, so on Facebook, you can find me by searching my name, Julian Antonio, if you're one of my mutual friends. If you want to find me on Twitter, type in Julian Antonio. My profile photo is the Rhode Island Hope poster that was drawn for COVID-19 with a girl holding the torch in the air. If you want to find me on Instagram, my photo is with me wearing black, and the channel link is in the bio of my Instagram page. If you want to find me on Tumblr, you can find me on uh, the My Dad Listens to This blog, which is where I post some of my episodes, uh, which is where I post all the episodes, excuse me. Or if you want to follow my main blog, Beneath the Opera House at Eric's Angel 666, I just mostly talk about Phantom of the Opera, but I post a lot of fan art and stuff like that. So um, please definitely check me out on there too if you're interested. And if you're a friend of my dad and you want to get the episodes through him, email dad, I'll email the episode to him, and he'll email it to you. All right. What could be more difficult? <laughs> All right. As always, thank you for listening to another episode of My Dad Listens to This. We hope you enjoyed your day. And everyone, please do have a happy Father's Day and celebrate with those you love. Thank you and good night. Good night.